Hey guys, uh, this is going to be a very quick short crash course on paper 5, 9701, A-Levels Chemistry. Uh, so uh, it's, a, it's a small paper, a very small paper that carries a very small weightage around approximately 10%. And uh, it is of 30 marks. It's got two questions, uh, question one and two, roughly divided into two parts, uh, 15, 15 marks each. Now, uh, now, paper five is known as your planning analysis and evaluation paper. And what happens in paper five is that uh, you can do, it's like an ATP alternate to practical where you design or plan an experiment. Uh, you analyze results if if data is given uh, you draw conclusions you make graphs out of it draw conclusions uh, whatever the conclusions are you've done different experiments in in your chemistry lab and then um, you evaluate the results uh, so anyway so, the, so there'll be roughly two questions the first one is usually about designing and planning and analyzing things the second one is more about uh, analysis data would be given uh, drawing conclusions making graphs evaluation so so the second question is more about that uh, and the second question usually has to deal with it has to deal with your uh, at, le at least there's one graph in the second question most of the time now the first part about uh, about uh, about paper five is that you should be familiar with your uh, tools in the lab that you have all the experimental procedures, etc. So, so we'll just qu quickly go through all the apparatus first, very, very quickly. And, and you have to know things in a bit more detail about each one of those apparatuses. Not all of them, uh, there are lots of them, uh, just the common ones, TK. So we, we'll just go to cover the common ones. Now, here's a here's a list of different uh, apparatuses. Uh, they're given different names. So we, we're just going to stick to the ones that Cambridge uses. And uh, uh, we'll just... Uh, Go through them very very quickly so starting with the first one uh you've got a beaker uh everyone knows that uh it's remember it's not used for measurement so if anyone is going to tell you uh to measure something never use a beaker that's that's obviously it's got it's got markings on it but, but definitely no measurements are taken using a beaker the markings are only there to give you an approximate estimate that how much of a liquid or solution can you add into a beaker so it's mainly used to store solutions um um, and you can do reactions in a beaker. Uh, not that suitable for reactions that are vigorous um, or that involve uh, the production of a gas because there's going to be bubbles and effervescence would be produced. And uh, uh, just like your uh, fizzy drinks, which come out of the glass, uh, the solution might fall out of the container and there's going to be a lot of spillage. Uh, this is also known as uh, uh, solution would be lost in the form of acid spray there's a thing called acid spray that, uh, especially in reactions that involve that involve acids, like carbonates plus acid, it would produce a lot of bubbles of carbon dioxide and a lot of spray would be produced. Uh, you dissolve substances in a beaker. Think that's used for dissolving substances. So uh, you want to crush something and dissolve it. You, you're going to use a beaker. Uh, it's also used for heating, water bath. It's used as a water bath. Uh, cannot collect gases in it. It's got a big opening, so anything would escape from the top. You can't, you can't put a stopper on top of it. So, so if there's anything that involves uh, the collection of a gas, if you use a beaker, then you obviously lose marks. Uh, so that's about about it for for a beaker. Uh, water bath is that when you heat something, uh, you can heat or boil water into it, and then you could put test tubes into it if you want to warm a substance or to a particular temperature. We, we're going to come to water bath later on. The second piece of apparatus that's very common, that's your conical flask. Uh, that's uh, extremely suitable for reactions. Most reactions, specifically uh, titrations. So we, we can be very specific that the reactions, any reactions mainly, but uh, they're often used in titrations. Uh, why? Because uh, it's got a small opening. It's good for gas collection. Uh, there's going to be less spillage if you swirl it, shake it, if you want to stir it vigorously. Because of the smaller opening, there's not going to be there's not going to be any spillage. Uh, what about gas uh, gas collection? So easily stoppered. You can put a stopper on top of it. Uh, uh, this is already given frequently used for titrations. So that's your colorful flask. Uh, the third one. That's 
a volumetric flask. Uh, it looks like this. Uh, and remember, all these apparatuses, they come in different sizes. So you, you, if you write a 50 cm cube volumetric flask, that's fine. There's a 50 cm cube volumetric flask. There might be a 25 cm cube volumetric flask as well. There might be a 500 cm cube volumetric flask as well. So the so so the size of the apparatus that's arbitrary. They're available in many different sizes. So it's your requirement which size you you want. Uh, now this one volumetric flask is used specifically specifically for making uh, solutions. Uh, so especially making a solution. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna talk about solutions uh shortly uh the next part i'm going to talk about is uh is how do you the pvc apparatuses all of them they were not used for measurements one was used for making solutions one was mostly used for reactions uh the beaker was had a more general use now how do you measure the volume of a solution the first one apparatus that's uh, very accurate that's a uh, burette it's very accurate it's uh, it measures values up till up till two decimal places uh, so example for example 24.50 cm cube could be measured over here uh, always remember that uh, that when i say that the values any apparatus if it measures the value up till two decimal places that means the graduations would only be up till one decimal place. The accuracy of the apparatus is always one decimal place more. The reason that is that when you look at a burette, it can only measure values up till one decimal place, actually. For example, this value over here is 22.5. This one over here is uh, 23.1. So any apparatus is actually, any apparatus, whatever the graduation is, you're going to write the value one decimal place. You're going to add an extra decimal place to it. So, for example, if this is 21.5, you're going to write it as 21.50. If this over here, this value over here is 20.4, you're not going to write 20.4. You're going to write 20.40. So, make it a habit, add an extra decimal place whenever you take a value. And I'm going to give you the reason why you add an extra decimal place. You add an extra decimal place. Why? Because... Uh, Every apparatus, every measurement apparatus has an error in it. Uh, so what that error is, and let me show you. So what that error is, that error is the smallest graduation divided by two. So for example, over here, if my <laughs> unit has these values, 22.1, 22.2, or 22.3, it obviously has no graduations in the middle, no graduations over here. Now, your level of your solution is never going to be exactly 22.2. It might be slightly higher than 22.2. It might be slightly lower than 22.2. So any value that's close to 22.2 or within this range, half a graduation to the right and half a graduation to the left, any value that's within this range, that is going to be called 22.2 because that's the closest graduation. Any value that's closer to 22.3, you're going to call it 22.3. Anything that's closer to 22.1, you're just going to call it 22.1 because there's no marking over here. So you're just going to go with 22.1. So the error is that when you say a value is 22.2, that means it could be half a graduation to the right or half a graduation to the left. It could be within this range. So that means half a graduation. The error is the smallest graduation divided by two. So if the smallest graduation is 0.1, over here it's 0.1, 22.2, So the distance from this point to this point, that's 0.1. Your error is going to be half of that, which means that anything that you call 22.2, that could be plus minus 0 0.05. So it could be over here or it could be over here, but you're still going to call it 22.2 because that's the only available value you got. Now your reading was actually one decimal place, 22.1, 22.2, 22.3, but your error is actually two decimal places. So, so that's why you add an extra decimal place. So make it a habit. Remember two things. Firstly, uh, whatever the apparatus graduations are, 
whatever the reading you, you can read of an apparatus, add an extra decimal place. And what is the error? The error is always going to be half a graduation. So the smallest graduation divided by two, that's going to be your, that's going to be your error. So, so when you use a burette, uh, the error in a burette, if I write 24.5, some, let, let's say if I write 24.5, the error in this value is going to be half a graduation, which is 0.1 divided by two. So it's going to be uh, 0. 0. 0.05 plus minus 0. 0.05. Now, the next thing is about the burette. Whenever you use a burette reading, it's always two values. Uh, two values in a way that uh, you're going to fill the burette to the top first. You're going to use some of it. The level of the liquid is going to decrease. So you're going to take two values. It's going to be an initial burette reading and there's going to be a final burette reading. Um, now, the solution. Now, two things about this. You're always going to read the lower meniscus. Always the lower meniscus is red. Uh, if it's a colorless solution. If it's a colored solution, you can't see the lower meniscus. You always read the upper meniscus. Uh, avoid uh, parallel error. You're going to see it uh, parallel to the level. If you see it from the top or from the bottom, the reading is not going to be that accurate. Uh, when you're using a burret, uh, make sure there's no trap there. So what you're going to do is run a little liquid. So there's no trapped air. So that's one thing. Um, so always do that. Um, this is how you're going to construct the table of a burette, uh, but we, before we come back to the table, let me talk a little bit about more about burette. Remember, when you have a colored solution, never fill the burette to the top, because then you're going to you're not going to see any graduation. So if you if you have a colored solution, which is uh, where you can't see the leading, never fill it to the top, because then no graduations would be visible, and you wouldn't know whether you're at the zero centimeter cube mark or not. Uh, because if you fill it till over here, so the, all the graduations are are obviously uh, not visible. So we can we can add this that uh, for colored solutions, never fill. Burette to the top. Why? As all graduations will disappear. You need to see some of them so to get a reading, right? So you need to see the top graduations, at least some of them. So all your graduations are going to, they're going to disappear. So don't do that. Uh, a few more things about this. Uh, how do you wash a burret? Uh, always, when you wash a burret, uh, just make sure that uh, you wash it with distilled water or tap water, but you're always going to rinse it with the solution that you're using it for. Always do that. Um, so after washing a burret, Always rinse with the solution that you're using it for. Uh, 
uh, that would be important because uh, then all the water, uh, the only contaminant would be the same solution that you that you're going to use it for. So that's why any contamination would would disappear. Here's how you're going to uh, make the table. You'll have the initial purity reading. You're going to take the initial purity reading, and then you have a final purity reading. For example, over here, uh, not sure over here. And then you're going to take a difference, and that's the volume of solution that you're going to use. Make sure you know how to make the tables. There's going to be experiment number one, experiment number two. Uh, we can add uh, headings. So we've got experiment number one, experiment number two, and so on. Now, since the volume of solution you've figured out in a buret is actually what? It's the difference of two values. Like the buret is going to be filled over here. You take a value, you use the solution, the, the level drops. You take the other value and then you calculate a, you calculate a difference. Now, since any buret reading is actually uh, a difference of two buret values, always remember that what happens to error is that whenever you do addition and subtraction, the error gets added up. So if your first reading was 0.10, it wasn't actually 0.10, it was actually 0.10 plus minus the smallest graduation divided by two, which was 0 0.05, that was your error. The second buret reading was 25.20 plus minus 0 0.05, that was the error. So whenever you take a difference, the error gets added up. So your buret value, the final buret value, the one over here, this one, actually has an error of 0.1. The error adds up. So 0 0.05, 0 0.05, it's going to be 0.1. So the final buret reading, the value of the solution that you're using, the volume of solution that you're using, that's actually 0.1. <laughs> now, now that's point one. Uh, do we have anything else about the period? Uh, now let's move on. Uh, you'll be asked to calculate uh, percentage error. Your percentage error is uh, the error over the actual value. So if your buret value was 25.10, the final volume of the buret was 25, or the final volume of the solution that you use was 25.10 plus minus 0.1, your percentage error is actually going to be 0.1 divided by 25.10 times 100. So that's your percentage error. Now, there, there are two ways of actually decreasing the percentage error. One way is you take, uh, you take bigger measurements. So one way is you're going to take larger values. So you either take a bigger value. Uh, the percentage error is going to drop. The second way is you reduce the error. So how can you how can you actually reduce the error? Uh, more accurate apparatus that's with more graduations. Well, there's nothing more accurate than a buret, so so we can't really improve the accuracy of the buret. If we were using a meshing cylinder, we could have done that. So remember, percentage error, they're going to ask you a lot about percentage error. So how do you uh, reduce the percentage error? Take either bigger measurements, larger volumes, larger quantities. The percentage error is going to be lesser. Or just reduce the error itself. Use a more accurate apparatus. That's the other way. Now, uh, a few things about the buret, a few more things. Uh, I mean, there's probably a drawback for a buret. Uh, in some cases, if you want to use uh, or do things quickly, you're not going to use a buret because uh, buret has a very small no nozzle and it uh, the solution is poured dropwise. So if the solution, if you want to do things very, very quickly, you would have to uh, use something that's poured 
that's quicker. So that's one of the drawbacks for using a burette. Uh, too slow. I said, let's move to the next one. This one is an easy one. Uh, so we've got we've got a pipette. Uh, I mean, pipette is your general. It's like a it's like a dropper. It's it's got a it's got a suction device at the top, which is known as a pipette filler. Uh, a rubber pipette filler. Uh, it only measures about uh, 25 cm cube. Exactly measures 25 cm cube. Only has one graduation, one mark. Uh, so what a pipette would do is that uh, uh, if you want to accurately measure something, the volume could be different. You could have different size pipettes. Uh, you use it to transfer liquid from one container to another. Uh, usually the other container is a conical flask. If you want 25 cm cube of something, you're going to just use a pipette and accurately measure it, it's very, very accurate. Uh, it's got an error of plus minus 0 0.06. So that's kind of close to a burette. It's got no graduation, so this error is like uh, measured otherwise, uh, not by that formula, which is the smallest graduation divided by two. Uh, next one, we've got a measuring cylinder. Uh, it's very fast. Drawback is not very accurate. Uh, normally, uh, measuring cylinders uh, don't have a lot of graduations. Uh, and remember, the wider the bore or the wider the radius of the device, the less sensitive it becomes. Uh, like if I add water or something to it, uh, the level is not going to rise that quickly. So so you're not going to see much of a difference. So, so the thinner the bore, the thinner the radius of the device or diameter of the device, the more accurate and sensitive it is uh, to small changes. So this is not very accurate, but the good thing is it's fast. So if you want to do things quickly, you always use a measuring cylinder. You, you never actually use a pipette or a, or a burette in that case. So that's your measurement devices. As I'm moving to the next part, which is that uh, this is about heating uh, and the apparatus that is involved in heating. Uh, the first thing is uh, you've got a Bunsen burner. Okay? That's the obvious uh, source for providing heat. Problem with Bunsen burner is that it's strong heating. So it's usually used for decomposition. If you want to boil something, uh, water of crystallization, you want to. So it's, it's usually for strong heating, uh, 800 to 1000 degrees centigrade. So that's that's like pretty strong. Uh, the heat is not distributed evenly, so you use a clay triangle, a wire gauze to distribute the flames. Uh, uh, you need always have a tripod stand. Uh, you heat substances whenever, mostly when you're using Bunsen burner, it's strong heating. It's uh, you got a ceramic crucible with lead uh, for strong heating. Uh, you can actually use it for gently heating. Uh, one way to do that is you can put some gap between the flame and the in the test tube, but overall still in that, even in that case, it's kind of strong heating. Uh, for gentle heating, you've got electro electric heaters with thermostats or um, now electric, electric heaters with thermostat, you can set a temperature and it's going to, uh, it's going to, uh, it's going to, uh, the temperature would be set Let's say if you set it at 45 degrees centigrade, it's going to maintain that 45 degrees centigrade temperature. Uh, water bath is used. Uh, usually, they always use the word thermostatically controlled. That means, uh, uh, I mean, this is like a manually controlled water bath. Water bath is you heat some water, you put the substance into the water in some container. Uh, the property of water is <coughs> that it does not change, it changes temperature very slowly. So it maintains, water maintains its temperature or it doesn't increase or decrease that quickly. So if you have a water bath at let's say 70 degrees centigrade, so for like two, three, five minutes, uh, the temperature would kind of remain at 70 degrees centigrade. It would drop very, very little. Uh, you can monitor the thermometer. If the temperature is dropping, you can sort of provide some more heat. Um, if it rises, you you shut down the heating. So so you can maintain the temperature over here at a particular temperature. Water bath is usually used for indirect and gentle heating. If you want to gently heat some something. Now, uh, 
you need some safety devices when you're when you're heating. Uh, the first thing is you need use gloves so you don't burn your skin. Um, use tongs to hold the apparatus because it's obviously hot app apparatus. Uh, gases can usually be produced when you're heating something because decomposition normally produces it normally produces gases, which can be toxic and they can be corrosive. So in that case, fume cupboards are used. So remember, fume cupboards uh, you heat it in a fume cupboard, a glass cupboard. So that the fumes don't escape. <coughs> now, some issues or errors while you're while you're heating something. Uh, number one error is heat loss. You want to just prevent any heat loss. So, insulating jacket, styrofoam cup, uh, put a lid so that the heat does not escape from the top. Uh, take readings uh, very very quickly. So that's the number one error while you're while you're heating something. Uh, any other source of heat, I mean heat loss is the number one error that's going to be caused. Um, and what else can happen while you're heating something? Uh, mainly the others are safety precautions. Uh, another thing that could possibly happen is that. Uh, about heat loss, I'm just going to talk about heat loss a little bit. So this is about heat loss. The greater the temperature or the higher temperature or higher temperature, there's more heat loss at higher temperatures. There's always going to be more heat loss at higher temperature. Um, why? Because there's going to be a bigger temperature gradient. So, for example, if your if your substance or solution is at 100 degrees centigrade, the surrounding environment is at 10 degrees centigrade. So there's a huge, huge temperature gradient and there's going to be a lot of heat loss in that case. So, so always remember the higher the temperature, uh, there's going to be more heat loss. Uh, if your solution was at 20 degrees centigrade and the surrounding environment was 10 degrees centigrade, then the heat loss is not going to be that great or it's going to be very little. So remember heat loss increases uh, exponentially if the temperature is very, very high. Now, you'd be asked to uh, decrease the temperature as well. How do you do that? You use an ice bath. Uh, an ice bath is um, put the solution in ice. That's it. Pretty much it. If you've got gases, uh, what do you do? You use a U-tube. Uh, if gases, you want to cool down gases. Like if you want to condense water vapors that are being produced. Uh, so what you're going to do is you, you're just going to uh, pass the U-tube through ice or a cold water bath that contains ice, uh, and that's it. It's going to get cooled. There are other ways of cooling a gas. One of them is a Liebig condenser. Uh, there's water in and water out. Uh, so it keeps the environment cool. So for gas condensation, that is also, that is also used. So let's um, move to the next part, which is uh, which is gas collection. So gas collection, first one, gas range. Pretty much, I guess you can collect any gas using a gas range. Gas range. Uh, not really. Yeah, you can pretty much collect any gas using a gas range. This, it's got a lot of graduations. Uh, pretty accurate. Uh, comes in different sizes. Uh, so I guess. Uh, that's perfect for, for any gas. Um, one thing about gases when you're collecting gases is that gases can expand and they can compress with temperature and pressure variation. So the temperature and pressure should be kept constant when you, when you, whenever you're collecting gases because 
at a higher temperature, you're going to get more gas because the gas will expand. There's going to be thermal expansion. Uh, at a higher pressure, you're obviously going to get less gas. Uh, so gas volumes are going to be uh, are always going to be, going to vary with temperature and pressure variations. So make sure that you try to keep it as constant as possible. Uh, always discard the initial samples of gas collected uh, as they are contaminated by air because right at the beginning, this tube is going to have air in it, even before the gas comes in. Like if you've got a pipe uh, and there's <coughs> you attach it to a cylinder that contains gas. Initially, the pipe is going to contain air because the gas hasn't come yet. So there's no vacuum, there's, there's air present. So the first sample that you're going to collect uh, would be of air. It's not going to be of the gas because the gas is coming from there. It's pushing the air inside the inside the whatever device you're using to collect it. So the first few samples are always discarded because they are contaminated by by air. Um, about the same thing, gases. There's a safety precaution as well that gases can also contract when apparatus cools down. Uh, this creates a suction effect. So gas collection should be separated before cooling down apparatus. So if your apparatus gets heated up, always disconnect the gas because, because if the gas is cooled down, they're going to create a suction and they're going to pull whatever solution or liquid there is. So it's like a straw, like you drink from a straw, there's going to be a suction effect and whatever solution there is on the other side, that's going to be pulled through the straw into the into your apparatus, so so always remove uh, remove the uh, delivery pipe when you're collecting gases or cooling it down. After you've collect collected your gases, always remove the delivery pipe. Always remove it before you actually uh, cool down the apparatus. And so here's another way: there's you can collect gases over water. So you can use any aqueous solution. <coughs> And you can do that. Uh, the gas will be bubbled through water and it can be trapped into this gas jar or it could be a, an inverted measuring cylinder. And you can measure the volume. So you can read the readings over here, measure volume. The uh, problem will be if the gas is soluble, then obviously this method is not going to work. Uh, so <coughs> you should know about which gases are soluble, like hydrochloric acid, ammonia, meth methylamine, Carbon dioxide is partially soluble. So, so ammonia, amines, acidic gases, like like NO2 gas, that's soluble, obviously. A lot of acidic gases, I can I can add more of them. Uh, NO2, SO2, SO3. They're obviously they're obviously very soluble gases. Um, if you're collecting a gas over water, it's always going to be contaminated by water vapors. Uh, water vapors are obviously going to be there. So, so not suitable for soluble gases because they're going to dissolve. One way is um, the reason. One way, one reason why gases are sometimes collected over water is that they you're able to remove some impurities. Uh, if you have an acidic solution, you can remove uh, basic impurities. If you've got a basic solution, you can remove acidic impurities as well. So the gas could be, like if, if there's NO2 gas coming in and you don't want NO2 gas, you can just make the solution basic and the NO2 or acidic gas is going to get absorbed. Now, since your gas is going to be contaminated by water vapors, uh, you need to dry it as well. So how do you how do you dry it? Uh, you pass it through dehydrating agents. Uh, dehydrating agents are anhydrous salts like uh, calcium chloride, anhydrous, or you can pass it through concentrated sulfuric acid. Bubble it through. Make sure the apparatus is uh, drawn correctly. Make sure it's uh, airtight. And that's uh, that's one very important thing. Always, whenever you you're doing a gas collection apparatus. Always ensure that the apparatus is airtight. So make sure, make sure when you're doing this, 
you don't have large caps uh like over here um try to like let me just seal it properly because it feels that they are that they are gaps in between so let's just seal this properly and do this in your drawings as well because if they see if this spot a large gap uh even write it that uh, that this is your this is your rubber bunk that has been added to seal the to seal the apertures anyways this is uh and i just uh, calcium chloride uh now one thing about gas collection is the uh, one interesting thing about gas collection is that uh sometimes you have a reaction you do a reaction and gas gets collected and you whatever way you collected doesn't really um, i mean we're not discussing that but you've got a reaction and gas gets collected now the problem is how do you actually do the reaction because to start a reaction you would have to mix two things and you would have to open the container now if you open the container the gas would obviously escape from the top so how do you mix the reagents mix the chemicals so that uh, the apparatus remains air tight now one way to separate the reagents is uh, that you sort of use techniques uh, maybe put one of the reagents in a in a small test tube and uh, the solution could be over here you can shake it so that the tube falls into the solution and the reaction stops so without opening the apparatus the reaction can start and gas collection can start without any gas leakage so you would have to prevent you would have to make a um, yeah you would have to create a method where if you want to start a reaction you don't have to open the apparatus so remember this method it's usually a solid which is kept in a tube i, I mean normally it's which reactions would use gases it's carbonate plus acid or metal plus acid or or uh, what else i mean it's the, these two reactions that produce gases so the way that's done is you have one solution the other one the solution of the solid is kept in a small tube uh, or a small bottle and you just shake it and it falls into the into the solution so that's gas collection there's two more methods uh heavy gases greater than 29 that's uh, they are collected uh heavy gases greater than 29 29 is the mr of air that's basically air if they're heavier than air the gas would get trapped at the bottom downward delivery light gases they get trapped at the top uh the problem with this method is you can't really measure it i mean you can collect the gas but you can't you can't really measure the gas that's being collected at so what else uh we've got a thing which is a calorimeter as so calorimeter is a device for measuring uh absorbance at different frequencies of wavelengths so if you want to measure color somehow uh you use a calorimeter it's a uh, i mean that's it just i mean you don't have to go into details a calorimeter measures color intensity at a particular frequency so blue dark blue light blue they have different frequencies and you can measure uh so the absorbance of the calorimeter is basically proportional to the frequency so absorbance is proportional not frequency sorry uh it's proportional to the to the concentration of of that substance so that's that's absorbance for example whatever this let's say you've got copper sulfate uh so the higher the concentration the more blue color it's going to emit and uh, or reflect so you're going to see a lot more blue color and you you're going to get a lot of absorbance for blue wavelength uh if you've got a green color solution maybe cobalt carbonate is green so you're going to see a lot of absorption at the at the green frequency so so the higher the absorbance the higher the concentration of the substance 
in the solution. Now, uh, the next part that we're going to do is uh, we're going to talk a bit about experimental techniques. Achha, I'm not, uh, just a little bit, uh, a few basic experimental techniques. Ke, uh, first thing, um, uh, measuring mass, we didn't talk about measuring mass. Uh, we've got a top end balance, uh, even have that old type of balance, which is, uh, which is, uh, let me just Google that and show you what I'm talking about. Just one second. So here's your old balance. Uh, the older version, you can use that as well. Top end balance is your electronic balance. So the thing is, uh, uh, how do you weigh the mass of a substance? Uh, what you do is you measure the mass of the container with whatever this is, FA1, let's say. Then you have, uh, like if you're heating it uh, or if you want to, if you're using it, uh, there would be some residual FA1 or some substance that would still be left in in your in your uh, in your bottle, and so you measure that mass, and then you take the difference. Uh, so you subtract the mass of the container plus FA one from the mass of the container without FA one or with the residual FA one, and you take the difference, and you'll get the mass of FA one used. Now again, you're you're actually taking a difference. So remember, uh, whenever you weigh something you always uh, take the difference. And when you're taking a difference, and masses are always measured using a difference. Normally, they're always uh, measured using using differences. So let me just add this One second. So just remember right now that when you take a difference, the errors will get added up. So the error in one value will get added up with the error in the other value. Now there's another question that is frequently asked as well, and that is, uh, how do you make a solution? So they're going to they're going to make a lot of solutions, and they're going to ask you about about making these solutions. Now, the way solutions are made, for example, if they ask you to make a 0.1 mole per dm cube solution of NaOH and the volume should be 250 cm cube, uh, solutions, remember, are always made in a volumetric flask. They always have this one, one marking, which is 250 cm cube. So what you do is you measure the mass of NaOH that is needed. That's concentration times volume. You'll get moles. Moles times MR that you'll get the mass. So for example, one gram of a solution is required. So you need one gram of one gram of solution. Now, one problem with one gram, we're going to come back to one gram. Uh, you're going to measure the mass one gram. You're going to put it in some distilled water. So add NaOH one gram into 100 cm cube of distilled water. You stir vigorously until NaOH dissolves. Then what you do is you transfer the contents of the volumetric flask and add all the washings into the volumetric flask. So you, so you wash it with some distilled water, transfer it into the volumetric flask, and you make it up till the 250 cm cube mark. So that's how you add one gram of any which into a 250 cm cube solution. Put a stopper on it, shake the volumetric flask so that it dissolves properly. Uh, here's a marking scheme uh, explanation given that uh, weigh the stopper container of FB1, record the mass, uh, tip all the FB1 into the beaker, you weigh the container with its stopper, record the mass. So that that is basically, you're recording the mass of the solid that you're dissolving. Uh, add approximately 100 cm to distilled water into the beaker. Stir with a glass rod until all the FB1 dissolves. Transfer the solution into the 250 cm volumetric flask. Wash the beaker with distilled water and transfer the washings to the volumetric flask. Rinse the glass rod with distilled water and transfer that washing to the volumetric flask and make the solution up till the up till the mark uh, by adding more distilled water. Shake the flask thoroughly and uh, then you label the flask. So, so this is basically overall what's happening. Measure the mass, 
which which we have discussed earlier transfer it dissolve it in a volume in a in a beaker first and then once it's dissolved transfer the washings transfer the solution uh, uh wash the stirrer transfer that washing into the volumetric flask as well and then shake it vigorously by putting a stopper on top of it and then you label it accordingly now one thing about uh, about these uh, solutions uh, that when you're making these solutions um this was one problem and that problem is this thing one gram now you've got a big problem one gram is a very very tiny quantity the problem that's going to happen with one gram is that remember i told you earlier that uh, per stage error is what it's uh, it's the it's the error what is per stage error I explain to you per stage error was the error over so over uh, the value into times 100 now if your value is coming out to be like really really small if this value comes out to be really small uh, the percentage error is going to be really large so small mass will have a large percentage error So what is then done is that you don't use one gram. What you instead do is you use 10 grams. Now, if you use 10 grams, your solution would be 10 times more concentrated because you're using 10 times the quantity. So always a more concentrated solution is made or prepared. So, so what, what is going to happen is I mean, we, we specifically to this case, 10 grams, uh, that is 10 times 10 X is used. A 10 times more concentrated solution is prepared. So 10 So there's going to be less percentage error because measuring a bigger value, you're going to get a smaller percentage error. So 10x concentration is prepared. And then it's diluted. So what you do is you you measure a much bigger value and once that bigger value is measured uh, you're going to dilute the solution at the end so the concentration would be 10 times higher but at least the percentage error would be less and then you further dilute it how do you dilute it you add distilled water i'm going to come to dilution further so so uh, so if you want to dilute something 10 times so what you're going to do is uh, for example, you can take 25 cm cube of it and make it up till 250 cm cube by adding distilled water. So it's going to get diluted 10 times. Um, so that's how, once you have a very high concentrated solution, diluting it 10 times is easy. So here's how dilution should happen. Uh, for example, if you want to prepare a much lower concentration solution, so you've got 0 0.005 mole per dm cube anyway, uh, you want to prepare that solution. You want to prepare 100 cm cube of it. And you've got a concentration, you've got a much higher concentration solution. So, so you've got, so here's, how, here's what you're going to do. You've got a 0 0.1 mole per dm cube anyway. Now you've got a 0 0.1 mole per dm cube anyway.
and what you need to do is you need to prepare uh, a point double zero five mole per DMQ by NOH out of it. DM cube NOH out of it. And the volume must be 100 CM cube. So the first thing is uh, you're going to figure out what volume you should use. Uh, for that, uh, the simple idea is that if you want to do this, if you want to create this solution, remember C1, V1, that's moles concentration times volume. C2, V2, that's moles in the other solution. So if you use this solution to prepare or dilute it by adding water to it, because you're obviously diluting it, you've got a much higher concentration solution and you want to dilute it to 0 0.005 mole per dm cube NOH. The way you're going to do this is, since you're adding water, that means the moles are going to be the same. The moles over here, N1 would be the same as the moles over here because the rest is just water, you're adding water. So you know the moles that you need in the final solution. So you, that's 0 0.005 mole per dm cube times uh, the volume is 100 cm cube. That's uh, divide, going to be divided by 1,000. So you know, these are the moles that are required. So these are the moles that should be added into the solution. So uh, so this concentration is 0 0.1 times you don't know what volume you should use. So the volume is unknown. So, so that's what you're going to try and find first. What is the volume of this higher concentration solution that should be used? So you're going to take 0.1 to the other side. And let's say this volume is Let's keep it in uh, CM cube so the thousand gets divided, cancelled out. So it's going to be 100 divided by uh, 0.1, I guess. So what do you what do you get? 0 0.005. And let me do the math. So this is 0 0.005 uh, multiplied by 100, and then I have to divide it by 0 0.1. Now that gives me five cm cube. So the idea is that you're going to take five cm cube of this higher concentration solution and you're going to make it into a hundred cm cube solution with distilled water. So, so add five cm cube of what, 0 0.1 mole per dm cube. Any which. And let's say I have a volumetric flask. Uh, where's the volumetric flask? Uh, we don't have it here. So I'm gonna take a volumetric flask and transfer everything into that volumetric flask. So let me So let's say that's my volumetric flask. That's my 100 cm cube mark on that volumetric flask. I'm going to take this and then add distilled water. And I'm going to make it up till the 100 cm cube mark. So the idea is that if you want this solution, you need these moles, N2. So you need these moles. You've got a much higher concentration solution. So you find out what volume is required. So you, so the moles would be exactly the same. So you figure out the volume. So you just need 5 cmq of this higher concentration solution. You're going to get the same moles. You're going to get the same moles uh, using 5 cmq of this solution. You put it into the conical flask. And if those moles are present in 100 cm cube, you get this concentration. So you fill it up till 100 cm cube with distilled water, and that's it. So that's how you prepare a dilute solution from a much, much higher concentration solution.
uh, remember always that higher concentration, you turn it into a lower concentration, the moles would be exactly the same. The rest is just be water being added when you're diluting it. So figure out what volume is required. Uh, use that volume, you'll get the moles and turn the volume by adding distilled water into this 100 cm cube and you'll get a more dilute solution. So that's how dilution happens. So remember this procedure. And uh, and always remember that why is a higher concentration solution always prepared? Because it's going to have bigger masses. So the percentage error would be a lot, lot lesser. So now let's uh, move to uh, titration curves. Uh, uh, let's just talk about acid-based titrations. Uh, what happens in acid-based titrations is uh, you got two things reacting. Uh, usually one is an acid, the other one is a base. Uh, uh, so you can either add the acid to the at the top, base at the bottom, or it could be the other way around. You can have uh, the base at the top and the acid at the bottom doesn't really make a difference. Uh, one of the concentrations is unknown. Usually, it's the top one. It could be the bottom one as well. Uh, it could be either. Be, it could be either one of them. So you know the concentration of one of them. You don't know the concentration of the other one. Uh, what happens is that you let's say you've got NaOH at the bottom. <coughs> so you start adding acid from the top. At a certain point, the NaOH is going to get completely neutralized, and that is the point which is known as the equivalence or the neutralization point. And that is the point where you should stop adding the acid from the top. Because if you add acid in excess, you keep on adding, there's no NOH left and your acid is going to go in, in excess and your solution in the flask is going to become, it's going to start becoming acidic. You don't want that to happen. So you should stop the tap uh, of, the, of the burette at that particular point when NOH gets completely used up. So how do you know that the NOH has completely used up? Because you're just seeing colorless solutions falling or mixing, right? So you don't, you don't, so how, what is the visible result, which is going to tell you that there's no NOH left in the flask over here. So you've got various titration curves, uh, pH curves. For example, if you've got NOH in the flask, the pH is very alkaline initially. It's a strong base. It's very, very strongly basic. Once it gets neutralized after a certain amount of acid, acid has been added, the pH is going to touch seven. It's going to become neutral. And if you keep on adding the HCl in excess, uh, the pH will become acidic. So if you add too much of the acid, the pH of your solution is going to turn acidic. So the, so the pH curve would be basic as long as base is present. As long as it gets neutralized, it becomes neutral. And when acid goes in excess, it becomes acidic. So you need to basically stop over here <coughs> at around pH seven. That's where you should stop. You've got various uh, titration curves depending on the strength of the acid. So, for example, if you've got a if you've got a weak base and a strong acid titration, uh, the pH is not going to be very very basic initially. It would be around eight to nine and uh, nine to ten. So, but it will eventually become acidic once you add too much acid into it. Or you might have a weak acid and a strong base. So, so initially it would be very strongly basic. Then the acid goes in excess. But it would not be that acidic because the acid inherently is a weak acid. So whatever happens, your titration should stop at this vertical point when the pH is changing, when it changes from basic to acidic. That is when you know the acid is going in excess, and that is when you should know you should immediately stop. So you should stop at this vertical point in any of this. So, so for a for a strong acid, strong base titration, the pH. Uh, you can stop at anywhere between from nine, nine to three, I guess. Uh, all of that would work. For a strong acid weak base, uh, the stopping point would be somewhere around because you're adding a strong acid. So the neutralization point would be slightly favoring the acidic side. Uh, so you would be around seven to, let's say, three. And for a weak acid, strong base titration, you should stop around. Uh, uh, because you you have a strong base, so the neutralization point is is slightly more towards the basic side. So so you should stop around uh, let's say seven to between seven to ten, seven to nine, I guess. <laughs> a weak acid, weak base titration never really goes to completion. So it eventually reaches an equilibrium. So that titration never completes. So this graph is kind of irrelevant. Anyway, so who's going to tell you what the 
what way the pH is changing, you'll you'll have indicators. Uh, the more common ones are methyl orange. It changes from orange to yellow around pH three to four. Phenolphthalein eight to nine that uh, changes from purple to colorless. So depending on what what indicator you've added. So so over here, if I if I in this titration, if I add uh, phenolphthalein, initially it's basic, so it's going to be pink. Uh, but then when acid goes in excess, uh, the pH will drop and it will become colorless. If I add methyl orange, initially it's going to be basic, so it's going to be yellow. It's going to be on the yellow side. And then when acid goes in excess, it's going to turn uh, orange, red orange. So hopefully you should know basic indicators. Uh, the other indicators all work in exactly, in exactly the same way. Then you have this very important titration, which is a redox titration that uh, is... KMnO4, usually it's KMnO4. And Fe2 plus is in the flask. It could be anything else, but uh, but normally it's KMnO4 that's being added. Uh, so in these KMnO4 titrations, uh, the purple KMnO4 turns colorless when it reacts. So as soon as the drops hit the Fe2 plus and a redox reaction occurs, the KMnO4 turns colorless. So it's going to, it's going to keep on turning colorless as long as you have Fe2 plus in the solution. The moment the Fe2 plus gets used up, the purple KMnO4 that drops into the flask will remain purple because it has nothing to react with. And that will tell you that the titration should be stopped because there's no more Fe2 plus left. The KMnO4 is no longer turning colorless. So the KMnO4 will continue to turn colorless as long as there's a reaction happening. The moment it remains purple, that means uh, the all reaction has stopped. So the color change... Uh, should be from colorless to purple. It's going to remain colorless. It's going to continue to react. So colorless, colorless, as long as reaction is happening, it remains purple when reaction stops. So colorless, colorless to purple, that's your cue for stopping the burette uh, and closing the tap. Now, uh, and over here is the telling us that KMnO4 don't fill it up till the zero CMQ mark. Why? Because uh, no graduations will be visible. So whenever you have a colored uh, solution in the burette, don't fill it to the top because all graduations would become invisible and you wouldn't be able to take the initial initial reading. Then there's another type of titration that's known as an iodometric uh, titration. It's a titration where uh, it, it just involves iodine. Uh, they could give you any reaction. There are lots of reactions. Here's one that's a thiosulfate with iodine reaction. What happens in this case is that thiosulfate falls into it and the iodine gets used up. It turns into it turns into I minus one. So it turns into I minus one. So this iodine um, slowly gets used up. The iodine is like really dark brown or blue black initially. So as you start the titration, the iodine gets used up. So the color changes very, very slowly. It turns to light brown, then it turns to yellow, pale yellow. And that is the point where you stop actually. So the, so the color change is not very abrupt. It's a very slight gradual color change. So what you need to do at this point is that when you stop, start seeing this slightly yellow color, that still means there's some, some iodine left. So what you do is you add starch. Starch would give you a very dark blue color as a, that will indicate that there's still iodine left. You continue to add uh, thiosulfate from the top. When the last molecule of iodine gets used up, the starch will go colorless because there's no longer any iodine left at that point. So uh, that's when you should, when you should actually stop. So iodometric titrations, in between you add starch, that is basically your indicator, but not at the start, right? Somewhere at the end, you add the starch. Now, uh, we're gonna talk about enthalpy change. Uh, you'll get enthalpy change questions. Uh, enthalpy change is Q is equal to mc delta t. That's how you figure out uh, figure out the energy or heat produced in the reaction. Now, this uh, m is your mass of solution, which is equal to the volume of solution. So, if you've got a 50 cm cube solution, the volume is 50 grams, assuming that it's mostly water and the density of uh, the solution is going to be taken as uh, one gram per cm cube. So, so the mass is always taken of the solution. C is the specific heat capacity, and that's around 4.184 almost any solution. Delta T is the temperature change. It's the initial temperature minus the final temperature. To be more specific, this thing over here is actually written as uh, Q is equal to minus MC delta T. Why? Because uh, the temperature change is often described as, as the final temperature minus
minus your initial so minus your initial temperature uh, one other way you can actually figure it, figure out the sign is that uh, uh, if there's an increase in temperature it's an exothermic reaction so you could you could just put the minus sign yourself if it's, if there's a decrease in temperature that's an endothermic reaction and always remember that uh, the volume of the solution is going to be the total volume combined volume of both solutions together so for example if you if you're doing a reaction which uh, in which 25 cm cube HCl and 25 cm cube NaOH are being added together, then that would mean that the total volume of the solution is 50 cm cube and the mass of the solution is going to be taken as 50 grams. Now, there would be issues regarding your final temperature and your initial temperature. Like how do you how do you measure the final and initial temperatures? Uh, now the initial temperature has no issue. You just put the thermometer into the into the into the flask and um, wait until you get a steady reading when the reading stops changing. So that's your that's kind of your initial temperature. That's it. Figuring out the final temperature is kind of difficult because there's a lot of heat loss. And uh, so the curve or the temperature change would, would appear something like this. That if you plot the temperature over time, when the reaction starts, if it's an exothermic reaction, the temperature will start to increase and it will reach a maximum. And after that point, once the reaction stops, the temperature would start to decrease again because everything will come back to room temperature back again. So you'll get a, you'll get a cooling curve. Uh, Vice versa, if, the, if it's an endothermic reaction, the temperature would initially first drop and then it will start to rise back again. Uh, so, but then it will eventually reach the, reach the uh, room temperature back again. Now, one way to measure the final temperature is you just measure the maximum temperature that's reached. So you've got your initial temperature and the maximum temperature, that's your, that's your final temperature. A more accurate or the second method of doing this is you extrapolate. You make this curve and assuming that initially you have a lot of heat loss, you extrapolate the cooling curve backwards. The point at which it intersects at T is equal to zero, that's your, that's your final temperature. That uh, compensates for the heat loss because this curve, the cooling curve represents heat loss that's happening, the rate of heat loss. So you can extrapolate this rate of heat loss and you can figure out, you can compensate for the heat loss that's happening. And you can reach this point and that's your basically your final temperature, not this one, the lower one, but the slightly higher one. This value compensates for the heat loss. And so extrapolation is a much better, more accurate way of, so if they ever ask you to actually improve the accuracy of this experiment, uh, so you, you extrapolate your cooling curve and find out the final temperature, the true final temperature, the one that has uh, that has compensated for the heat loss. For an endothermic reaction, it's going to be the opposite. It's you, you're just going to follow the heating curve and where it's getting heated back up, and that's your that's your final temperature, which is whatever that is. Now, most of the heat loss experiments they have errors due to heat loss. That's the main error. So how do you prevent heat loss? Uh, use a styrofoam cup, use an insulating jacket, use a lid to cover it. Uh, now, uh, temperature readings are always, remember, unreliable. So due to sudden drops in uh, temperature. So always remember to, and there's gonna be a lot of random errors. There's gonna be, sometimes there's gonna be a draft of air. So, so you'll have a, a bit more heat loss. Sometimes there might be a fan on. So, so temperature readings are quite quite unreliable. Temperature uh, heat loss happens very, very quickly. So always remember, you always take the average of many readings. Um, so you get rid of these random fluctuations in temperatures. So that's one way, always take many, many readings. And this applies to almost anything. Uh, always take as many readings as possible. The next part is rate of reaction. Whenever you have a rate of reaction experiment, <laughs> uh, what is rate? It's, it's 
measuring any change, how quickly that change is happening with respect to time. So any measurable observable change, it could be mass, volume, color, concentration, anything. Color can be measured using a colorimeter. The colorimeter absorbance will give you an idea of the concentration of whatever the product is. So uh, the change could be an increasing change. For example, uh, for example, if this reaction, H2 gas is being produced, so, so the volume of H2 gas will increase. So the color change could be positive and the color change, or, sorry, the color change, the change is positive. The change could be negative as well. The mass of solution is decreasing. So the gradient could be negative. So first thing is the gradient or the steepness of your graph is equal to the rate of the reaction. If it's steeper, that's fast. If it's less steep, that's slow. And always initial rates are compared, which means that you don't measure the rate of the reaction after like 20 seconds. You measure the rate at T0 to 0. Right when the reaction starts, you figure out how fast the reaction is. All reactions would eventually slow down and they'll come to zero. So, so the important fact is always measure the rate initially. A lot of these rate of reaction questions are about finding the order of reaction about how the rate of a reaction is dependent on the reactant. Uh, order zero means that the rate of the reaction is not dependent on the reactant concentration at all. Order one would mean that uh, if A is one, that means that it's directly proportional. You increase the concentration of your reactant, the rate of the reaction will also speed up. And order two would mean that uh, you double the concentration, the rate of the reaction will quadruple. So, so you always investigate this. And whenever you do any investigation, you always try to keep the other variables constant. Other variables that can affect the reaction. So if I... So you have to keep everything constant, temperature, pressure, anything that could affect the rate of the reaction, you have to keep all other variables constant, except for the variable that you're trying to investigate. So, so temperature, pressure, catalyst surface area, you can keep the other reactants in large excess so the concentration also remains constant. Now, technically rate of reaction is one over time uh, taken for a particular change to happen. So you can, what you can do is you can, you can fix the change. You can say that, let's say you're waiting or you're, stop, you're, you're timing it for 20 cm cube of H2 gas being produced. Well, for one reaction, it takes five seconds for 20 cm cube of H2 gas to be produced. For the other reaction, it takes 100 seconds. So the one that takes 100 seconds is a lot slower because it's, take, it's taking a lot of time. So always remember the rate is one over time. Uh, what you can do is you can just either draw a gradient or what you can do is uh, just have a measurable change and always measure that change, how quickly that change happens. Whether there's a two gram decrease in the mass of the solution, time it, how quickly that happens. So rate would be directly proportional to one over time. Uh, now, a lot of times you'll be asked to figure out the order. Now, when you take the log of this expression, it will be log of rate versus A log of reactant concentration. So. This is in the form of y is equal to mx. Uh, so if you plot log of the reactant concentration versus log of rate uh, on a piece of graph paper, then m is your gradient and m is your order of reaction. So you plot log of rate versus log of reactant concentration and the gradient over here is going to be your order of reaction because this equation now looks exactly like y is equal to mx plus c. So, um, so m or a over here can be found out by plotting a graph as well. The next part is, so two things over here. Uh, keep all other things constant. Uh, keep other reactants in large excess, keep them constant. Plot a graph of log rate versus log of reactant concentration and A will be your, the order will be your gradient of the graph. Uh, A few things about this is that uh, when you're using a stopwatch, uh, the stopwatch is, if you're using a stopwatch, then remember this. The faster the reaction, the faster the reaction is, uh, the error in a stopwatch depends on, on your reaction time. For example, here's your time that's, that's ticking. 
you had one second, then two seconds, then three seconds. So one second, two second, then three second, and so on. So the time is ticking. And let's say you were you were supposed to stop at this point. Now your reaction time error. Uh, it depends, it varies. So if the reaction is like very, very slow, it would be very hard to actually, uh, in certain circumstances, like there's a color change that's happening gradually. So if the reaction is like very slow, uh, uh, then it would be, I mean, you could be very accurate, you could stop at the right time. If the reaction is happening very quickly, and let's say you're, you're reaching the 10 CMQ mark of H2 gas, and it's happening very quickly, then the amount of error in your stopwatch, you stopping the stopwatch, that could be a lot. So imagine always when they ask you about, look at the situation, imagine is your error in your reaction time, that that's where the error is coming from. Uh, there's going to be some uncertainty. Maybe you are stopping the stopwatch slightly ahead, sometimes slightly before the actual thing happening. So think of your reaction time. Will your reaction time be larger or greater in a particular circumstance? Uh, so for example, if I want to stop at 10 cm cube of H2 gas, if the reaction happens very quickly, then there's a big chance that I might miss this point. I might not be able to like, this is the 10 cm cube mark at which the H2 gas got formed. And I had to stop my stopwatch at this point, but I ended up stopping my stopwatch at this point because the reaction happened very quickly. If the reaction happened very, very slowly and gradually, uh, then probably my reaction time would be a lot, lot better. So always think of your reaction time error in these values. A few things about graphs, uh, a lot of free marks for graphs, make sure you learn how to plot a graph. Uh, whenever you plot a graph, make sure that uh, at least 70% of graph paper. Has to be covered. Choose your scales very, very wisely. Uh, there's going to be a lot of questions about independent variables, independent variables. Independent are the ones that you are the ones selecting. Dependent are the ones uh, on which things will depend. For example, if, if you are doing a rate of reaction question, then I'll be changing the concentration of the reactant. Uh, the rate will be the dependent variable. It will be changing because of that. So this will probably be my x-axis. This will be my y-axis. So So always independent variable is uh, put on the on the x-axis. Dependent variable is put on the on the y-axis. And uh, remember to plot the graph very neatly. Take a scale that covers at least seventy percent of the graph paper. Uh, see, uh, make a best fit line. Um, sometimes they're going to ask you for a line. Just draw a line. So see if it's a straight line or not. Sometimes they're going to be very specific. Draw a straight line. Uh, they don't usually write curve. They just write either the right line or the right straight line. A line does not necessarily, I mean, sometimes a line could mean a straight line. Sometimes a line could mean a curve. It depends on what kind of points you have. If the points, they look like a curve, then it's a curve. If it's if it looks like a straight line, then it's a straight line. But if they are very specific, if they're right straight line, then you've got just one option and that is to draw a straight line. Uh, the line should be above and below equal number of points should be spread, scattered all around it. There should be some anom anomalous points, which you should ignore that could, that would be either very far away or that could be very far away from the line. So ignore those points. If most of your points are like close to the line, that means your result is very, very uh, reliable. Always, whenever you're plotting this line, make sure, try to think about the fact that will the line pass through the origin? So for example, if, I, if I'm measuring a heat change experiment where temperature is increasing, so maybe the line never crosses zero. It, it's not supposed to cross zero maybe. Um, or at um, whatever's happening, maybe the line never, temperature never reaches zero degrees centigrade. Maybe at zero degree, at zero volume of CHCLC, it was at room temperature. So, so try to think of the experiment and see if the line should pass through the region or should it not pass through the region. Um, now, uh, also remember that, uh, if your points are like, like if you're plotting 30 centigrade 
if your points are points are lying between 30 centigrade and let's say 50 centigrade and you have to plot points from 30 to 50 uh, don't fr start from zero uh, you can ignore zero because uh, if you start from zero then half of your graph would be empty so you can start from 30 over here and then plot up till 50 so that most of the points lie within that range so you don't always have to start from zero as well uh, now reliability we did talk about that if points are close to the line repeatable points that's that means reliable an unreliable result would probably look like this where if even if you plot a line the points are too scattered so it's it's very subjective uh which is why they're going to in the marking scheme they're going to probably go for both answers uh depending on what the reasoning is for some if some people think that this is consistent and reliable then they have to give a reason for that and the reason for that would be that the points are very close to the line, which obviously is not true in this case, but uh, uh, they'd probably mark you correct for that, for the, for the correct reasoning. Uh, but this one is obviously unreliable. Uh, how, do you, how do you make a system more accurate? Uh, uh, just improve the equipment or use larger values. We did discuss that earlier. A lot of times when you're plotting graphs, uh, Remember, you'll be asked to represent equations in the form of y is equal to mx plus c. Uh, so always uh, remember that uh, that any equation could be represented in the form of y is equal to mx plus c, and make sure that you you present your equation, whatever that equation is. For example, if uh, if a equals k b cube. So that means that if I plot, uh, if I make it equal to y is equal to mx, that means I need to plot b cubed versus a. b cube is going to be my x and uh, a is going to be my y. m is going to be my gradient, which is give, going to give me k. So make sure any equation, whatever the polynomial is, whatever the power is, uh, whether it's got a log or not, any equation could simply be compared with y is equal to mx plus c. And then accordingly, you choose your you choose your y and x axis. And you'll, you'll get a straight line. So anything could be changed into a straight line equation. So what else do we have? We've got, uh, remember decomposition experiments. Uh, in decomposition experiments, remember that there are three reactions, mainly that uh, you should know of carbonates decomposing, nitrates decomposing, hydroxides decomposing, strong heating is required. These questions, the mass will decrease when they decompose. In most of these questions, they're, they're going to ask you, how would you ensure that the decomposition is complete? You repeatedly heat and leave it until the mass stops changing. That's known as heating till constant mass. Uh, the device that you that's used for strong heating is a crucible. Initially, you always gently heat it. Why? Because you need to remove water. If water is not removed, water droplets will appear on the side of the test tube. Uh, and this causes spitting as well. Because if water evaporates and starts bubbling, They, they can be spillage. Your solid can actually fall out of the container or some piece of your solid can fall out of the container. So there's going to be some bit of spillage that's happening. So make sure uh, avoid that as well. So, so I've, uh, I've kind of covered most of the uh, basic stuff, experimental stuff uh, related to paper five. Uh, I've got other videos where I'm doing past papers related to paper five. So you can, you can have a look at those uh, questions uh, and paper five videos. So just a little bit more of what's given in the syllabus, mark allocations, planning, defining the problem method, 12 marks, analysis, conclusion, evaluation. That's like 12 marks. Uh, the remaining six marks will be allocated across the skills in this grade and the allocation may vary from paper to paper. Okay, so expectation for each skill, paper five, planning, identify a safe and efficient procedure, identify the steps, 
necessary to carry out the procedure, identify operators, show an understanding of the risks of a proposed experiment, identify the independent variable, identify the dependent variable, express the aim of an experiment in terms of a prediction. They'll ask you a lot of times to predict what's going to happen. So you must have some knowledge of overall, you must know something about, uh, about chemistry. I mean, I mean, that this thing will be related to P4, like all you have studied chemistry all your life. So you must be able to predict something about the reaction. Identify any variables that are to be controlled, show an understanding of how and why the procedure suggested will be effective. Uh, describe the method, describe the arrangement of apparatus, uh, appropriate measuring instruments. Always remember when you, whenever you draw an apparatus, make sure you tell them the capacity as well. Um, and you should know about, about the accuracy of the apparatus as well. Uh, suggest whenever you design an experiment, uh, suggest appropriate volumes and concentrations, precautions. Um, so draw up appropriately headed tables. Yeah, tables, that's important. Always draw good tables. Uh, that's, uh, we, we, did, we did some tables related to mass, but always remember it, the experiment itself could come from anywhere. So make sure, just use your proper common sense, your basic knowledge of uh, practicals, how tables should be drawn. Uh, so let's ignore that analysis and conclusions. Uh, we did this, any equation could be written in y is equal to mx plus c. You have to plot graphs properly, uh, calculating percentage errors, significant figures used, etc. So conclusions, the rest, uh, you'll be asked to identify weaknesses as well, anomalies, why those anomalies happen. You'll be able to, you should be able to guess why in a particular experiment, those anomalies will happen. So anyway, so we did the basic stuff, paper five, that's the basic stuff. So just remember that uh, pretty much that's about it. That's all paper five, the techniques, technique wise. The rest is just practicing more past paper questions. So hopefully uh, practice as many past paper questions as possible. Uh, keeping in mind the knowledge that you gained from this video. So, okay, everyone, take care. Allah Hafiz.